1869, Mendeleev, looking at all these elements that had been discovered and trying to figure some way to order them, to arrange them. Chemists, scientists in general, look for order, we look for patterns, we categorize things. So he noticed that certain groups of elements had similar properties. And he found that if he took these elements and listed them in order of increasing mass, the properties appeared in a periodic pattern. To be periodic means to exhibit a repeating pattern. Do you know what they have in the periodical section of the library? They have magazines and newspapers. Those things are published periodically. Some newspapers every week, some magazines every month. So it's a regular repeating thing. So he summarized this as his periodic law. When the elements are arranged in order of increasing mass, certain sets of properties recur periodically. It's a little bit like the keys on, on a piano. You start with middle C, say, and you go, you keep going to the right, and eventually you come to another C note. And they are octaves, and they're related to each other. They have some um, things in common. So here, if we look at these blue ones, lithium, sodium, potassium, have similar properties. And I imagine him taking like index cards and writing stuff down and it's like, let's try to make some sense out of this. It'd be interesting to know exactly how he did that. But what he did is he took the elements that were known at that time and arranged them into a table. And he arranged the rows so that the elements with similar properties fall in the same vertical columns. So he took that long strip and he arranged it so that lithium, sodium, and potassium were in the same column. And beryllium and magnesium and calcium had similar properties, and they're in the same column. And it worked out beautifully with all these patterns. So this is a, a simple portion of a periodic table. There were gaps in the table, though, because there were some elements that had not been discovered. And so what he did is he predicted with surprising accuracy that there were, would be elements discovered, and he went so far as to predict their properties. Um, so he predicted an element he called, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, echa, echa silicon, which means below silicon. So he said, there's a hole here. There should be something. We're going to find it someday. And in 1886, it was discovered by Clemens Winkler, who named it germanium after his country, Germany. And this is how, in 1869, Dmitry Mendeleev completed his first periodic table. Tetris, anyone? So in the modern periodic table, the elements are listed in order of increasing atomic number rather than increasing relative mass. Mendeleev was not aware of the protons being in the nucleus. That was discovered and figured out later. And the modern periodic table has a lot more elements because more have been discovered over time. And then because discovering new elements, you know, they ran out of new elements to discover, so they started creating elements. And there's groups of scientists busily making new elements. And so that's why we keep adding things to the bottom there. Um, so here's, here's an illustration of a modern periodic table. There's a lot of information crammed in here. Um, there's this stair-step line, um, which this one I, on the wall, I believe somebody sharpied the line in. I might get up there later and make that a little darker. This stair-step line, I think, is a, a very important feature. It divides the non-metals from the metals. On this one, it's color-coded. The colors are kind of faint, but these pale yellow ones are metals. The green ones over here are nonmetals, and then the guys right along this line are metalloids, and they have properties that are between the nonmetals and the metals, just like they're between them on the periodic table. Um, these guys down here, really we should take a pair of scissors and cut the periodic table between this row 3 and 4 and insert this, because as we're going along, 55, 56, 57, 72, no, I should go in here, 58, through these guys. And so this series, this 
um, row here, these are called the lanthanides because they come after lanthanum. And the row below it are called actinides because they come after actinium. But that makes the periodic table too fat for a piece of paper. And we don't use those guys very much anyway. So we cut them out and stuck them at the bottom where they're there if we need them, but they don't make the periodic table too awkward. So these are basic classifications. I showed you those divisions already. Um, some common properties of metals, good conductors of heat and electricity. You can pound them into flat sheets. They're malleable. They're ductile, meaning they can be drawn into wires. They're often shiny. And this is the one that's most important for chemistry. They tend to form cations. They lose electrons. Um, Nonmetals are on the upper right side. If you, um, like if you lose your mind on an exam, because that happens, right? After you write your name, you read the first question and you forget everything. And you have to identify them as metals or nonmetals. Well, look on the periodic table and pick a metal, pick a, an element you know something about, like oxygen. Even if you're in a brain fog on an exam, is oxygen a metal? No. It must be a nonmetal. So the guys up in that corner are nonmetals, and the metals are the ones on the other side. Um, there's a total of 17 nonmetals, five solids one liquid, 11 gases. Uh, we can tell the state from this periodic table by the colors. Red are gases at room temperature, blue are liquids, and black are solids. And the white ones are very, very unstable. In fact, many of them, we don't even know what state they are because we can't keep enough of them together long enough to see what state they are. They're not really very useful. Nonmetal properties, they tend to be poor conductors of heat and electricity. Not all of them, but most of them. They're usually not ductile or malleable. And most important for chemistry, they gain electrons. So nonmetals lose electrons, they become cations. I just said that wrong, didn't I? Metals lose electrons and become cations. Nonmetals gain electrons and become anions. Nonmetal negative ion, nonmetal negative ion. Then you've got the guys in between, metalloids, semi-metals. Uh, some of them are, are considered semiconductors because they conduct electricity a little bit, um, and that actually makes them very useful for making computer chips and things like that. They have properties that are between. Uh, we can also divide them by main group elements. The main group elements tend to be more predictable in their behavior, their properties. And then we have the transition elements or the transition metals, and they are less predictable based on their position in the periodic table. So these guys in here are the transition elements. They transition from this mountain on this side to this mountain on this side. These are the main group elements, the ones that stick up on both sides. So these guys are more predictable, and these guys not so much. We have vertical, vertical columns. The columns are called families or groups, and the rows are called periods. And then we have letters that identify the main group elements. Oh, good. This periodic table, well, actually, let's see. I'm going to go back to this one so I can, the YouTube people can see. There are two different numbering systems, group numbers. The one on the top is the current US usage. And since we're currently in the US, I say we use that one. It also just gives us, I think, more information. So the, the periodic table I give you on an exam will have both of them. But I prefer the 1A, 2A, 3A. All the main group elements have numbers with an A. And then we've got the transition metals in here, and they have numbers too, but we're not going to do anything with their numbers. The other way, the IUPAC method of naming just goes straight across, 1 through 18. It uh, probably has its benefits too, but not so much. There is something in common over here, though. This is group 3A or 13. So the 3 is the important thing. So just ignore the 1s on those guys, and you'll be fine. 
then some of these um, some of these groups have names, special names, like a family name, if you will. So the group A elements, 8A elements. Um, we've got periodic table, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon. These are called the noble gases. And so I think of those guys as being like sisters, and they have some things in common. You know, among my children, I have five sons, and they have a lot of things in common. They're not exactly the same, but they all like to play football. And so they have some common characteristics. The noble gases, um, what they're famous for is they are mostly unreactive. In fact, for many, many years, um, we didn't know of any compounds with noble gases that exist. Noble gases are like the nobles of Europe, and they don't mingle with the common folk. They just keep to themselves. They're very high and mighty and self-sufficient. Um, group 1A, these are called the alkali metals. These are reactive metals. Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium. I want you to know the names of these groups. Um, you take a marble-sized piece of sodium and it will explode violently when dropped into water. You take a chunk of sodium and drop it into a sink full of water, it'll blow the sink up. I mean, it's just, it's really violent. And lithium, potassium, rubidium, these are also quite reactive. Next group over, alkaline earth metals. So those words, those names are similar, the alkali metals, alkaline earth metals, uh, don't get them mixed up. Oh, here's something. Alkali metal, alkali, one word, group one. Group two, alkaline earth, two words. I just thought of that right now. These are fairly reactive, but not quite as reactive. Uh, calcium reacts vigorously with water, but it's not going to blow up your sink. Um, then if we go over to the other side of the periodic table, the group 7A, these are called the halogens, and these are very reactive nonmetals. Uh, chlorine and chlorine is a gas at room temperature. It's got a very pungent odor. Think swimming pool, right? Chlorinated swimming pool. Um, bromine's a red brown liquid at room temperature, which vaporizes into a gas very easily. Iodine is fun. It's a purple solid, but if you heat it much at all, you can get it to sublime and into a purple gas. Okay, this kind of is redundant. No, it isn't. Okay, a main group metal tends to lose electrons. We already talked about metals losing electrons. It's going to form a cation with the same number of electrons as the nearest noble gas. And a main group nonmetal is going to form an anion with the same number of electrons as the nearest noble gas. I hope I have a picture. No, I don't. Okay, so we'll have to draw something. That's okay. Um, pick a main group metal. Magnesium. Okay, how many protons does magnesium have? 12. And how many electrons does magnesium have? 12. What noble gas is nearest to magnesium on the periodic table? Now, really, I think the periodic table should be a cylinder, but that's going to be hard to keep in your backpack, right? But it goes on the second period, fluorine, neon number 10, sodium's number 11. So you can think of it as spiraling around. So which is closer to magnesium? Neon, right? So neon has... How many protons? And how many electrons? Ten. So if magnesium formed an ion with the same number of electrons as neon, that means it would have ten electrons. What would the charge on the ion be? We've got twelve positives and ten negatives. Plus two. Negatives just mess with your mind, don't they? And here we're talking about losing negative charges. That just gets extra com confusing. Magnesium forms a plus two ion. What group is magnesium in? 2A. 2A. Very convenient. Let's, let's look at a nonmetal. How about um, oxygen? 
how many how many protons does oxygen have? Eight protons. How many electrons? What's the nearest noble gas? Neon. So neon has 10 electrons. Oxygen is going to form an ion with 10 electrons. What's its charge going to be? Negative 2. If you look at the periodic table, one way to remember the charge of the anions, this might come in handy on that memorization quiz, is if you think of the noble gases, they don't make ions. They like their electrons. They're not going to get any more. They're not going to get any less because they're perfect just the way they are. And then we count backwards. Minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. Those are the charges of the nonmetals to the left. And for the, for the um, main group metals, we're wrapping around and counting plus 1, plus 2, plus 3. So the group 1A metals form plus 1 ions. The group 2A form plus 2. So group 1A tend to form plus 1, 2A plus 2, halogens tend to gain one electron form minus one. The oxygen family, I think they should have a name, but they don't. They tend to form two minus ions. And I kind of jumped the gun on this one. For those elements forming predictable charges, for the metals, the charge is equal to the group number. These are main group elements. For the anions, um, a different way to think of it is the group number minus 8. So oxygen is in group 6A. 6 minus 8 is minus 2. The transition elements, unpredictable. We'll deal with them later. So these guys, some periodic tables have, he have hydrogen on the right side and on the left side of the periodic table. He is the baby, baby of the family, okay? The last tag-along child he is the Andrew of the periodic table, okay? He gets away with murder almost, right? It's sad, but true. But hydrogen can form a positive ion and a negative ion. So in some ways he belongs over here, but in other ways he belongs over here. But he can't be in both places at once. But those give you predictable ions from the periodic table. Here's aluminum. Aluminum is in the main group. It's in group 3A. Aluminum always forms a plus 3 ion. These guys down here, we're not going to run into very much, so we're not going to worry about them. 